Hi, I'm Scott Jones, the uh, editor of uh, the 2016 Martian Migraine Press Anthology, Cthulhu Safa, Tales of the Black Gnosis, and I'm very happy to uh, have with me here uh, tonight uh, Gord Seller. Uh, he is the author of uh, a Cthulhu Safa story uh, called Hyros Gamos. Am I uh, pronouncing that correctly? That's the Greek, uh, isn't I it? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. I think it's the e, the H is actually silent in the original, but yeah. Anyway, okay. close enough for me. Close enough for government work, as we like <laughs> yep. to say. Okay, great. And it's of course, you know, I'm saying it's late night for me here, but you're actually uh, uh, coming to us uh, live from uh, from Seoul. Isn't that correct? Uh, well, just outside Seoul. Yeah, okay. but close enough. I'm on Seoul time anyway, and yeah, it's two thirty in the afternoon okay. here. So. Fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, very happy that you can make some time for us here today. No problem. Uh, so your story, when I when I first, you've, I mean, we had so many submissions, and they just ran the gamut from, you know, basically classic Lovecraftian tropes, uh, you know, sort of, you know, well done enough, but didn't quite get the theme that I was going for with Cthulhu Safa, which was, you know, basically uh, uh, enlightenment and transformation uh, through the medium of horror. And as I was reading your story, which is you know all about basically the uh, Iros Gamos, if I'm if I'm getting this correctly, basically means sacred marriage. That's right. Yep. So here we have a very it's a, it's a very sexual tale. It's got it's got a lot of punch in that mm -hmm. regard, and it kind of put me in mind of something that uh, are you familiar with the uh, chaos magician out of the UK, Phil Hine? Have you heard? Not of him? really. No. Okay. So he has this wonderful uh, statement where he basically says. He bemoans the sort of new age, you know, uh, the new age obsession with the, the, the peace and light of the various uh, uh, pleasant gods and goddesses of fertility. And the fact that, you know, if you approach them correctly, uh, they can be just as terrifying as any mythos entity. And that's what's interesting about your story is that it's not, it's not specifically a Cthulhu mythos entity. Uh, who, who, who does your uh, main character, who does your uh, protagonist encounter in Iros Games? Um, well, yeah, that's, that's an interesting, I was thinking about that earlier today because I thought you might ask me that. And um, I mean, I, I kind of, I didn't want to name it or anything on purpose and I'm not sure I actually have a clear picture of it except that it's some kind of being in the Lovecraftian you know, pantheon that we don't know about. It's some other creature that never made it into any of the other stories. I don't really have a name for it or anything Perfect. because I kind of like that to be mysterious. Yeah, it works out that way. Absolutely. It's a, it's a very dynamic, dynamic tale. Uh, so what were you working on that, uh, that, that led you to, uh, that led you to write Iris Gamos? Oh, well, um, I mean, I was, I was actually researching Ezra Pound, who's a, a modernist poet. Mm -hmm. Um, and mostly he's remembered for being a, a, a big fascist, uh, and an <laughs> anti-Semite. Um, but you know, I was working on this sort of strange or sort of occult novel about Ezra Pound and whatever. And, um, Pound and uh, some of the other modernists come up in the story because I sort of took off in another direction from researching about apparently, you know, strange occult ideas were really, really, really popular among modernists in the modernist literary scene. So, uh, you know, in the, in the twenties and thirties, um, they were, they were, I mean, it was, it was sort of, it was pervasive to the point that now we've sort of forgotten about that in some ways, you know, um, that, People like Ezra Pound were attending performances, uh, you know, sitting probably 30 or 40 seats from someone like Crowley, yeah, Alistair yeah. Crowley. And, and they were sort of in the same world in, in Kensington and all that. And, and we've forgotten that. So uh, I, I sort of jumped into that having another character that's, you know, stumbled onto that. 40 years later. Um, and that's the protagonist of this story. And, and, you know, Pound was obsessed with, with, uh, Eleusis and the mysteries of Eleusis and, yeah. and, and with sort of weird occult sexuality too. But, you know, that's something a lot of people don't talk about related to his work. So uh, that sort of all came together that way. It's a, you, 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 it's, <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> and it's a, you, your story is like a, a very profound confrontation with, with the other, which was another theme that I was going you know, that's another part that fits into the theme of Cthulhu Sattva is the, uh, you know, basically in encountering, encountering these, uh, these entities and these concepts, you know, these conceptual, you know, these structures and, and, and watching how they change us. And whether or not, 
I mean, oftentimes it's 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 seen, you know, in in modern weird in well, maybe not even modern weird fiction, but you know, there's a there's a tendency towards you know viewing it as horror, and there's certainly you know a horrific element uh, mm -hmm. in, in in your story, but you know we have uh, not to spoil anything, but we we have a survivor at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we're, we're it doesn't kill him, but it sure changes him. Yeah, absolutely, as as it would. As it would, you know, and he enters into it willingly, which is again another theme. So right. yeah, the story really struck me. It was it's, it's definitely it's definitely in my top five. Uh, oh, thank you. For the <laughs> <antho>. <laughs> <It's> flattering. <laughs> yeah, and I've read I've read too. Uh, I've I've sought out uh, some more of your material, and of course you you you. I actually it turns out I shared a, a table of contents with you in uh, Ross Lockhart's uh, Cthulhu Vatagan. Right, right, you know, right. You had this is... wonderful Dreamland story. Oh, there, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually haven't gotten around to that anthology yet because that was that arrived at my place around the time the baby was born. Right, so you're a new dad. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's that, I noticed that we were both on that table of contents. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fun book. I'm glad I'm glad to share it with you. I'm glad to have you in uh, in Cthulhu Safra as well. Um, so what can you tell us about the uh, Eleusinian mysteries? Has have are they still a mystery? Has it been sorted out, or do uh, we not know really. what went on there? I mean, we know bits and pieces of it, but not not that much because everyone in well, I mean, for a long time, everyone involved was sworn to secrecy, and and that seems to have been enforced. Um, at some point, um, you know, this be it became sort of like. Uh, riding the tire tube down the river in Laos or something. It was sort of the typical tourist business um, that everyone went to Eleusis. It's, uh, you know, sort of in, in uh, oh, when was that? I guess it would be about the third century. This It was just a regular tourist attraction. But um, but we, we still don't know exactly what went on during their, uh, their rites. Uh, we know sort of bits and pieces that there was an initiation, that they probably drank something called Kaikan, right. um, you know, stuff like that. But and so we're not really clear. So, I mean, that leaves it quite open to, you know, playing with, uh, you know, if you want to weird it up a little bit, you can you can do all kinds of funny things with it. So, absolutely. yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're, uh, you actually mentioned a few of the ingredients of uh, uh, Kaikan. Is that... Is that is that historically accurate? Uh, from from what we you know, it's all speculation. But right. yeah, that that's what that's what is believed. The penny royal was supposed to be the the toxin in it that right. uh, induced the narcotic effect. Yeah, right. Which doesn't strike me as all that potent of a potent of a thing. I don't know. I mean, what I <laughs> think is that it can kill you. Actually, really? so okay. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe okay. I'm thinking of a different herb. <laughs> <laughs> I have no experience with it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, what other projects are you are you, are you working on, Gord? What what can we expect from you in the, in the in the future? Well, uh, you know, uh, it's everything's working slowly now because of the baby. But um, mm -hmm. let's see. I mean, I guess the main two things I'm working on. I'm working on a, a sort of um, a collection of Lovecraftian stories set in different points in Korean history. So um, short stories, um, sort of re, re as, uh, how would I say, looking again at Korean history through a Lovecraftian lens. So, um, cause very it, neat. It, it fits so weird. It's very <laughs> odd how many moments sort of fit that. Um, and then uh, the other thing I'm working on is a really hard to explain story, but it's set in um, early Jordan, London. Um, and it's kind of like a, first contact singularity type thing, but, um, also very weird. And, um, it's got everything from sentient yeasts to, you know, like, uh, the rats with language. And I mean, it's just, it's a very strange novel. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's most of what I'm, I'm working on now. <laughs> that, that sounds fantastic. Can, can you give us an example of, uh, back to the Korean, uh, mm -hmm. Korean, uh, uh, culture and history. Can you give us, can you give us an example where we have an overlap between the mythos? And sure, they, sure, and, and that. Sure, I mean, there's, um, there's, there's a so there's a really famous admiral here called Yi Sun Chin. He was, uh, if anyone is watching who watches Korean films, there was a film a few years ago um, in Korean. It was called Myung Nang, and I think it was called something like Raging Torrents or something, something like that. Um, uh, so, uh, oh right, so uh, in one of my stories, um, I look again at this. This figure, Yi Sun Shin. Mm. So Yi Sun Shin is a is a South Korean, or a, sorry, a Korean admiral um, who uh, 
when Japan tried to invade uh, Korea at the end of the uh, the 1500s in the 1590s, um, you know, uh, essentially there was a really big war. It's a really important moment in Korean history, and there's this admiral who is, you know, kind of credited with repelling the the Japanese naval invasion, which pretty much saved. Korea. Right. Um, and uh, I started reading these folk stories about, you know, I, I was reading a book called The Record of the Black Dragon Year, which is sort of like fanfic that circulated among the peasants. Uh, like even, I think some of the stories were circulating during the war itself, and then they got written down. Mm -hmm. And it was, it became a bestseller in Korea, but it also became a bestseller in, in China at this time. I mean, and I'm talking, you know, in the end of the 1500s and the early 1600s. Um, and in this story, it's just bizarre because, you know, um, you know, the, the whole story is quite bizarre, the, the whole text, but the section that's dealing with this admiral, um, part of his strategy for repelling the, uh, the Japanese invaders is to go under the water, you know, um, he, okay. he has to take his fleet under the water to attack <laughs> them. I'm pretty sure there were no submarines in, uh, in, in the late 1500s in Korea. But so I sort of play, played with this idea, like maybe he had some deep one heredity and, you know, there's some relation to the deep ones and he can get the deep ones to help. Cause also there's this idea and it's very well shown in a recent film about him that, you know, the, the, the currents, the, of the ocean, the, the actual ocean currents helped right. him to overcome the Japanese. But of course, you know, that would be much easier if you had a bunch of deep ones helping you under the water. Absolutely uh, would. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, that's, that's one of the stories, um, you know, and the, there's, the, I have a bunch of different stories taking moments like that in Korean history where, you know, injecting some kind of Lovecraftian elements, um, you know, either just makes the story very interesting, especially if you know Korean history, it's very interesting to see it from this other point of view, but uh, it also sort of renders it a little bit, um, I guess, uncanny. Yeah. Because Yi Sun Shin, that, that admiral, is, is very much a beloved hero, right? Um, but if, if you give him monstrous heredity and that's how he kind of <laughs> saves the day, that, that sort of twists it in an interesting way, you know, it, it yeah. So, so anyway, that's, that's an example. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think that speaks too to how uh, you know these 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 are these are archetypal uh, th these are archetypal uh, images and, uh, and and beings that Lovecraft came up with. You know, which I think is why why they continue to resonate because we can map them on. You know, that's uh, that's again why why I wrote uh, my book when the stars are right. Uh, right, right, right towards an authentic relay in spirituality and why we're why we're doing Cthulhu Safa because you can get this you can get this wonderful you know, uh, uh, hybrid mutation going on, you know, and this is why weird fiction, you know, particularly of the Lovecraftian strain is, you know, it's going to continue uh, right, right. to function because there's always interesting things to say about who we are, what we're becoming, you know, these, these are the little maps that we, that we, that we make uh, with weird fiction. And, right. Uh, and, yeah. and what makes us nervous and what surprises right. us ourselves that we're not comfortable with. And yeah, yeah that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Very cool, Gord. Thank you so much for uh, for for coming and talking to us. No problem. Uh, Thank so, you. <laughs> so your story. <laughs> so the so the so the story is called uh, again. I'll pronounce it uh, probably incorrectly. Iros Gamos. Drop sure. I, 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 Iros Gamos. Yeah, Iros I think. Gamos. And, and yeah. uh, I hope. Uh, uh, I think either of us speak Greek, so it's <laughs> <No>. okay. <laughs> you know what? Maybe I'll I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll shoot uh, Nick Mamatas a text and say how did I, how how badly did I screw this up and he'll. <laughs> He'll tell me. <laughs> He'll I'm tell me. Here. He'll tell me. <laughs> but it's a fantastic story, and uh, we're gl very glad to have it in included. Uh, I hope readers like it as much as I did. And, Thank you. Uh, I hope they like it too. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And uh, Cthulhu Satva drops again. Its uh, official release date is uh, uh, May twenty third. So uh, not this Monday. Not 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 your Monday. Or, mm. Not tomorrow for me, but uh, for next. Uh, next Monday. Uh, so yeah, it's coming up. You can pre-order it now on Amazon. It's already showing up on BNN. And of course, you can order it directly from Martian Migraine Press, which we would prefer. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thanks, thanks very much, Gord. I'm going to let you get back to your day. Okay, and, thank you. Uh, we will talk to you again. Okay, have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.